A king once had a teddy bear, and a teddy bear had a king. The king's teddy bear had lived and been loved for a great number of years when it came to the year of the king's silver jubilee. Twenty-five years a king and fifty years a king's teddy bear, said the bear. And just in case the king forgot to send him a proper invitation, after leaving him for so many years neglected in the attic, he posted a letter to his majesty beginning, Congratulations, Eddie. Do you remember fifty years ago when we were both born? Love, Teddy. The king was receiving congratulations from all over the world at that time, from old friends and new friends and from perfect strangers. He did not have the least idea who Teddy might be. Nobody had called him Eddie since his babyhood, and he thought it was rather impertinent. There must be hundreds of his subjects alive, the king thought, whose names were Teddy and who were born fifty years ago. He never gave a thought to his bear, lying up there in the attic, all among the mice and the moths. So no invitation came to the king's teddy bear, and he cried a little because of waiting so long and being forgotten. Then he thought, if there is a jubilee and the king remembers me after all, I shall have nothing to wear. I must have a uniform. I must find my uniform. And he remembered that long, long ago, when the king was just a little prince called Eddie, they both had uniforms made for them, exactly alike in scarlet cloth, with gold braid and facings, black trousers and shiny black boots. And the teddy bear had worn a hat. He could not remember what the hat was like, but he thought it had a feather. He looked in all the boxes for his uniform, and he found it at last. Or was it his uniform? What he found was just a bedraggled, dusty little rag lining a mouse's nest. The beautiful facings nibbled by mice, the epaulettes still shining, had been thrown aside as the mouse babies had bitten them off. And the splendid scarlet front of it, tailored wide to hold the row of medals which the king would presently award his teddy bear, the scarlet chest was eaten into holes by ravaging moths. The teddy bear was too upset for tears. He stamped with rage and the mice fled for their holes. When they looked out again, he had retired to his box and was so unhappy he was pretending to be dead. The mice said they were truly sorry. They had not realised that the bear might need his uniform again. It is the king's jubilee, said the king's teddy bear, and I am the king's bear. Oh, have you had an invitation? cried all the mice at once, agog with interest. How can I accept an invitation without a uniform to wear, said the bear with his heart nearly broken. The mice persuaded him to get up. They brushed him and dusted him, and they brushed and dusted his uniform. They extracted a promise from the moths that they would mend the holes they had made, and at last they sent the teddy bear to bed comforted. In the morning, the uniform was ready beside his bed. The epaulets had been replaced, the buttons burnished, and the moths had made quite a good job of repairing the holes. The boots had been found and polished, the bear had forgotten they had spurs. The trousers were pressed and sponged. The mice were waiting for him to try everything on. The king's teddy bear put on his old uniform with great anticipation and delight. To his surprise, it hung upon him, as if it had been made for a much larger bear. Perhaps you've lost a little weight, the mice suggested. The trousers were very baggy too, but the boots were fine. The spurs clinked as the bear strutted about the attic floor. Some of the mice had found a mirror and were dragging it into the light so that the bear could see himself. He could hardly wait. All the long years seemed to slip away behind him as he imagined standing beside the king again, wearing his uniform to celebrate the Silver Jubilee. The mice propped up the mirror and the king's teddy bear stood in front of it looking at himself. He looked awful. After all, it had all happened such a long time ago. Many years of love had worn his muzzle thin. His eyes were made from different buttons. His paws were darned solid, every one of them. All that beautiful fur he'd been born with had disappeared, while a few strands of black wool were all that were left to show where his nose had been. I used to smile, said the king's teddy bear, but I haven't any smile left to smile with. The sawdust 
with which he'd been stuffed had run out of his body as the years went by. No wonder that his uniform looked so much too big for him. The bear went back to his bed without his uniform and cried and cried. The mice were at their wit's end what to do. We, we have some cousins in the country that are tailors, they told him. Their great-great-grandpapas were apprenticed to the mice that worked for the tailor of Gloucester. They will make you a new uniform. But the king's teddy bear would not listen to them. We, we, we have a friend in the country who will make you some trousers, the mice urged him. You've only to go and see him and tell him what you want. But the bear would not take any notice. We, we, we have another cousin in the country who will make you a hat, the mice promised. A fine jubilee hat with a feather in it. You've only to show him your invitation and he will make you anything you like to ask. But I haven't got an invitation, confessed the king's teddy bear, bursting into bitter sobs of despair. Meanwhile, downstairs in the palace, the king was making the last preparations for his silver jubilee. Something was worrying him, and he was feeling a little uneasy. I, uh, I, I think we've sent out all the right invitations, he told his secretaries, uh, and I think my uniform is all right, and my, my sword, my boots, and my crown and decorations, but uh, there is just one more thing on my mind that I'm not quite happy about. I, uh, I have a feeling I would like to invite my oldest companion to come and celebrate my jubilee with me. My, my, my dear childhood friend, my little old teddy bear, Teddy! And as he said this name, it came to the king in a flash that this was the explanation of the letter he had received. His dear old friend was alive and thinking of him and calling him Eddie. But where was he now? He must be sent an invitation, said the king. He wrote it at once in his own hand, but he did not know the address. And while it was waiting in the palace hall, it was collected by the mice and rushed upstairs to the attic. When the king's teddy bear read the invitation, Dear Teddy, please come to my silver jubilee, your friend Eddie, he could not believe his eyes and thought the mice were playing a trick on him. You wrote it to comfort me, he accused them. No, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, said the mice. Look, it has the king's own seal on it. Get up at once and make yourself tidy. The teddy bear got out of bed. But when he saw himself in the mirror once again wearing his shabby uniform, he was so dejected that he left the palace immediately for the country to find the mice's friends and cousins and to order a new hat and a uniform that would help to cover some of his shabbiness. The teddy bear walked for miles and miles, mostly in the dark, sleeping in hedges and under haystacks to avoid being run over or otherwise impeded. It took him a long time to get into the country and longer still to find the mice's cousins when he got there. And when he did find them, he discovered that he'd left his invitation behind. But the mice made no difficulties about doing all they could to help him. All along the mouse runs between London and the country, the word passed from family to family, this is the king's teddy bear. Please help him while you can. The tailor mice made him a new uniform in a few hours that fitted much better than the old one. They also made him a hat with a feather in it and a beautiful pair of trousers that didn't bag at the knees. Time was running away, and the bear knew he would travel more quickly without his fine new clothes, so he had them all sent ahead of him, mouse ways, up to London, and set off himself, carrying nothing but his new hat in a paper bag. Meanwhile, at home, the king was hunting all over the palace for his teddy bear. He felt terribly guilty that he'd left him for so long, neglected and unloved. He could not remember when he'd last seen him, nor when nor where he'd put him away. The palace was turned upside down with the general searching. The mice fled for their lives. At last, the bear's old uniform was discovered in the attic, side by side with the king's invitation, which the bear had left behind. But of the bear himself, there was no sign. We must put off the jubilee, said the king. Twenty-five years a king I may be, but my little bear has been my friend for fifty, and I cannot celebrate my jubilee without him. It was explained to him that if the king had wanted his teddy bear to go with him, he ought to have thought about it very much sooner, and it was too late to do anything about it now. The king went to bed very depressed indeed. When he said his prayers, he prayed that he might find his teddy bear in time for his jubilee. In the morning, he thought his prayers had been answered because the teddy bear's uniform was sent up in a box from the country, all new and shining and labelled for the king's Ted. The king put on his own uniform full of expectation. He remained quite happy and cheerful until the hour came for the jubilee procession to start and still no teddy bear had been discovered. Every drawer and cupboard in the palace had been turned out. The king's teddy bear was still missing. 
The bear himself had spent the night hurrying up from the country. Nobody had told him it would take so long to get home. He'd walked all night long, carrying his hat in a paper bag. Very reluctantly, the king left his palace and got into his state coach. The streets were crowded with cheering people, waving little flags, their hearts full of love and loyalty for their monarch. But the king's face was sad and solemn. He was trying to smile, but his heart was far away and long ago, up at the top of the nursery stair in a world where he was called Eddie and played with a furry, round-eyed teddy bear. The horses moved away, pacing beautifully. Down the wide streets and the stately avenues, they jingled between the cheering crowds, while happy shouts and the blowing of trumpets rent the air. The king's teddy bear met the procession as footsore and weary and carrying his new hat in a paper bag. He came at last to London and trudged down the great avenue known as the King's Parade. He saw to his astonishment the coach and its outriders bearing down upon him and realised that the Silver Jubilee had begun. He was so small and shabby and the crowds were so excited that they did not notice him scuttling along breathlessly under their feet. But the teddy bear's heart was breaking as he realised that he was too late for the Jubilee procession. The invitation meant nothing after all. The King had forgotten him. Everything was going on without him. His uniform would be waiting for him at the palace, but it was too late now for him to wear it. The king's teddy bear stood at the side of the road, paper bag in hand, lost and bewildered among the feet of the cheering crowd, while the great coach rolled down the avenue towards him. Peering upwards, he hoped beyond hope that the king might look down and see him before the procession passed by. But the king never gave a glance in his direction, and all at once the bear realised that the coach was going by and he wasn't going to have any jubilee at all. In that moment, the king's teddy bear risked all in one desperate effort to join the king. As the last wheel trundled past his nose, he made a great spring and grabbed at the axle of the coach just in time to prevent the wheels passing over his head, which would almost certainly have been squashed very flat indeed. There was a horrified gasp from the crowd and then shouts and screams and a loud cry there is something or somebody underneath the king's coach is it a bomb is somebody trying to assassinate him on his jubilee police 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 the police came running also guards and outriders and well-meaning members of the public the king looking a little pale looked over the side of the coach and saw his bear it isn't a bomb and it isn't an assassin, he announced to the hysterical people. Nobody is trying to kill me at all. It is just my very own and personal teddy bear. And he took the bear into the coach to ride on his knee. The king's teddy bear sat in the coach with the king all the way round the city and back to the palace. He had left his hat in the road. He had no uniform, no boots, no trousers, not even an invitation. But the people cheered him again and again. His paws were darned and his eyes did not match. And his nose was a most peculiar shade of grey. But he was celebrating his jubilee beside the king. And whether he spent the rest of his life in the palace or tucked away in the attic among the mice, he knew he was Jubilee Ted and the king's own teddy bear for ever and ever. Goodbye.